Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have another great show for you tonight. So, uh, we've got my co-host standing by here, Mr. Casper Leach. Over in the wings, John Cornett is ready to bring you some original music. We have a couple of great guests, uh, Andrea Herman and uh, Courtney Moran, both uh, hemp activists. We'll be talking about their work. They'll be here showing a movie and doing a class about making hemp creep tomorrow. But we'll talk about that a little more. We have a good hemp news segment, a little bit of show and tell. It'll work better when I wear this. And uh, we'll bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves first. I feel the force. Right, our first story tonight is from our nation's capital. U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder today issued an order establishing a new policy prohibiting federal agencies from accepting civil asset forfeiture assets seized by state and local law enforcement agencies unless the owner is convicted of a crime. The U.S. Uh, Treasury Department, which has its own forfeiture program, is issuing a similar policy. The new policy will greatly restrict the ability of state and local police forces to use federal law to seize goods without charging an individual with a crime. Civil asset forfeiture is a process by which authorities seize property alleged to have been involved in a crime, charge the property directly since goods do not have the same constitutional protections as their owners, and then keep most of the proceeds for departmental use. The Department of Justice becomes involved after a state or local law enforcement agency seizes property pursuant to state law and requests that a federal agency take the seized asset f and forfeit it under federal law. For years, advocates have criticized the Department of Justice practice of accepting and processing seized assets such as cash, cars, and other property from state and local law enforcement agencies through its equitable sharing program, which retains 20% of the proceeds from the seizure received from a state or local law enforcement agency and returns 80% of the proceeds to the state or local law enforcement agency that initiated the seizure. For years, this practice has been a major incentive for police to make false charges and seize assets without having to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and instead only meet the lower preponderance of evidence standard of civil cases. Friday's announcement means that police departments will still be permitted to make seizures under state and local law but they'll no longer be able to use the Department of Justice's equitable sharing program to use federal law to do so. The practice has enabled some state and local law enforcement uh, agencies to bypass state laws that prohibit police departments from keeping the proceeds from civil asset forfeiture or impose a stricter legal standard for seizing property. Civil asset forfeiture laws turn many fundamental concepts of democracy upside down, creating an assumption of guilt until proven innocent. Before today, anyone could have their money or assets taken by police without ever being charged with a crime and with little chance of ever getting it back. Today is a major victory for anyone who cares about due process and the rule of law. Drug charges are among the most commonly used to justify such seizures. They're particularly appealing because a court may permit the seizure of cash related to drug sales as well as any property associated with the alleged crime. This may include personal property such as boats, cars, airplanes, or land, owned by the alleged wrongdoer. The department then uh, is free to use these assets as they see fit. In most cases, property owners are unable to retrieve their property because of onerous appeals procedures and because the burden of proof shifted to the owners to prove their innocence rather than the burden being on the state to prove their guilt. Because the amount seized is often less than the cost of contesting the cases in court, five out of six people never challenge the case. 
across the river in Washington State, they have a headache. Implementation of Washington State's weak, badly written marijuana legalization measure, Initiative 502, continues to be plagued with problems. When legal recreational cannabis shops opened there last summer, there was a shortage of cannabis and high prices. Now, six months later, there's a glut of cannabis as the growers are left sitting on hundreds of pounds of product, but the prices are still absurdly high at the 502 stores. The big autumn harvest of outdoor cannabis from the eastern part of the state flooded the market. Uh, that would normally mean plummeting prices at cannabis shops, but even growers are worried about going belly up as the cannabis shops continue to charge $23 to $25 a gram or more than twice the going price either in the street or in medical marijuana dispensaries. According to Andrew Seitz, general manager of Dutch Brother Farms in Seattle, he says, quote, it's an economic nightmare, end quote. Licensed growers has harvested 31,000 pounds of marijuana as of Thursday, according to state data. But Washington's few licensed cannabis shops had sold less than 20% of that. Many cannabis users in Washington faced with ridiculously out of sync prices in the state marijuana stores have opted to stick with the less expensive cannabis they buy on the black market or at medical marijuana dispensaries. Washington has about 270 licensed cannabis growers but only 85 operational cannabis shops to which they can sell. The glacially slow, nightmarishly difficult licensing process is at least partly to blame. Other culprits are applicants for retail cannabis shops who won licenses, then failed to open, and bans in many cities and counties. Randy Simmons, the uh, Washington Liquor Control Board's marijuana manager, claimed that about 100 more cannabis shops will open in the coming month providing additional outlets for the glut. Also in Washington State, a Superior Court judge in Pierce County has ruled unconstitutional a state law which forbids doctors and other medical professionals from advertising medical marijuana authorizations in their advertisements. Washington State Judge Elizabeth Martin last week in a ruling said the law violates both the Washington and the U.S. constitutions by curbing free speech. While the state might have an interest in regulating such advertising, Martin ruled, banning it completely is unacceptable. Judge Martin wrote in her decision, quote, I find the statute impermissibly overbroad as it chills even informational speech aimed solely at public education. Back in Washington, D.C., on the other side of the country, the District of Columbia city officials moved forward this week with plans to implement a voter-approved municipal initiative depenalizing marijuana possession and cultivation offenses. On Tuesday, city officials confirmed that Initiative 71, which uh, was transmitted to Congress for review. Under federal law, all district laws are subject to a 30-day review process by Congress, during which time members may take actions to halt the law's implementation. Speaking to the Capitol Hill newspaper roll call this week, House Oversight and Government Reform Chairman Jason Shavitz, Republican from Utah, said that language previously adopted by Congress in December 2014 spending bill already prohibits District of Columbia officials from implementing Initiative 71 and thus no further action by Congress is necessary. However, several district officials, including D.C. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton and D.C. Council Chairman Phil Mendelson, said that the federal provision in question in no way blocks city officials from enacting the new law. D.C. Delegate Norton said in a statement, quote, the district's examination agrees with our analysis that the initiative was enacted when the voters approved it and will take effect at the end of the 30-day congressional review period, end quote. Chairman Mendelson agreed, saying, quote, I believe, I happen to believe that the initiative was enacted, so I think there's no question that after the 30-day review it will be law, end quote. The District of Columbia's Attorney General's office has not yet commented in regard to how the district will respond if Congress does not address the initiative during the review process. In November, 70% of uh, District of Columbia voters approved Initiative 71, which removes criminal and civil penalties regarding the adult possession of up to two ounces of cannabis and or the cultivation of up to six plants. Our last story tonight out of Atlanta, Georgia, the inhalation of one cannabis cigarette per day over a 20 year period is not associated with adverse changes in lung health, according to data published online from the Journal of the Annals of American Thoracic Society. 
Investigators at Emory University in Atlanta assessed marijuana smoke exposure and lung health in a large representative sample of U.S. adults age 18 to 59. The researchers reported that cannabis exposure was not associated with forced expiratory volume decline or changes in the values of small airway disease. The authors further reported that marijuana smoke exposure may be associated with some protective lung effects among long-term smokers of tobacco. The investigators acknowledge the pattern of marijuana's effects seems to be distinctly different when compared to that of tobacco use. The researchers also acknowledge that habitual cannabis consumers were more likely to self-report increased symptoms of bronchitis, finding that's consistent with previous literature. Separate studies indicate that subjects who vaporize cannabis report fewer adverse respiratory symptoms than those who inhale combustive marijuana smoke. The authors concluded, quote, in a large representative sample of U.S. adults, ongoing use of marijuana is associated with increased respiratory symptoms of bronchitis without significant functional abnormality in spirometry and cumulative marijuana use under 20 joints years is not associated with significant effects on lung function, end quote. This study is the largest cross-sectional analysis to date examining the relationship between marijuana use and lung health. A separate study published in 2012 in the Journal of the American Medical Association similarly reported that cumulative marijuana smoke exposure over a period of up to seven joints per year uh, was not associated with adverse effects on pulmonary function. A 2013 review, also published in the Annals of the American Thoracic Society, acknowledged that marijuana smoke exposure was not positively associated with the development of lung cancer, COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, or other lung diseases. It concluded, quote, habitual use of marijuana alone does not appear to lead to significant abnormalities in lung function. Findings from limited number of well-designed epidemiological studies do not suggest an increased risk of either lung or upper airway cancer from light or moderate use. Overall, the risk of pulmonary complications of regular use of marijuana appear to be relatively small and far lower than those of tobacco smoking." End quote. This paper, The Effects of Marijuana Exposure on Exploratory Airflow, a study of adults who participated in the U.S. National Health and Nutrition Examination Study, appears in this month's annals of the American Thoracic Society. It's the end of our hemp news segment tonight. I'm going to jump over to Mr. John Cornett. Thank hey, you, Bob. John. <clears throat> you know, I think that uh, the handlers of these politicians, they must, uh, they must be keeping them, the politicians dumbed down because, come on now, we've had enough experience now to know that cannabis heals. It doesn't hurt you. It heals you. The only thing it hurts is the stupid laws. I wish our politicians would just grow up. This is a song that I think you know, Paul. It's so nice to be stoned. It's so nice to be stoned. Proclamation was issued today by the government of the USA to 99 years in jail for illegal possession and sale. I may think they're right or they're wrong. Guess they've never been stoned. It's so nice to be stoned. Oh, it's so nice to be stoned. Well, it's so nice to be stoned. Well, it's so nice to be stoned. Marijuana is the killer weed. It's going to be the end of you and me. So says the TV news report. Excuse me while I take a smoke. Let's get together and take a tote of that magic smoke. Well, it's so nice to be stoned. It's so nice to be stoned. It's 
Well, it's so nice to be stoned. Bombs and tanks and riot gas can't keep you from smoking grass. Well, listen to me, brother, I'll tell you too. Marijuana is good for you. Oh, yeah. song I grew up on way back when uh, an old band called White Witch nice nice version there welcome to the show Andrea nice to see you Paul it's good to have you back Casper. Casper. Andrea Casper. Herman and Friday. Courtney Friday. Moran how are you two doing welcome Casper Fantastic. we are taking your calls tonight so if you have questions about ending adult marijuana prohibition or restoring hemp uh, give us a call at that number there on your screen 503-288-4442 We'll be taking calls periodically. So you two are a couple of our, our hemp pioneers in the modern age. You want to tell our audience a little bit about what you do, Andrea? Well, my name is Andrea Herman, and I'm from Joplin, Missouri. I am the president of Hemp Technologies Global, so we're working around the world to bring in hemp construction and agronomic trials and help with legislation. In addition, I am the president of the Hemp Industry Association, which is our national nonprofit focusing on industry needs and working to improve this sector overall here in the United States. In addition, having the opportunity to work around the globe to um, instigate and help with regulatory affairs and agronomics pertaining to industrial hemp. Great. Now, I know you've been involved in a lot of different events just while you're here in Oregon, not to mention before. You want to talk about some of those? Yeah. So we've just come from being at Oregon State University. I am the per lead instructor of WSC 266. It's the world's first only course solely dedicated to industrial hemp. It is a three credit hour course. Anybody can take this course from anywhere in the world. During that course, I was able to bring together 26 different guest lecturers to cover everything from the basic botany and anatomy of the hemp plant all the way into nanotechnology and biocomposites, including agronomics, food processing, quality assurance, um, and also looking at the historical context. And of course, as we know, everything is changing every day. Uh, just for instance, we just had news pass uh, here in Michigan. So we just had our two bills signed in by the governor in Michigan. So every day we're having more states come on board here in the U.S. And had the opportunity to join Paul and his wife, Teresa, in Uruguay. So it's been a nice journey. And now here in Portland, we are gearing up tomorrow for the Portland's first, or uh, Seattle, uh, sorry, Oregon's first Hemp Crete workshop. And that's going to be where? How if somebody's interested in finding out about you that? You can go do? to hempcreteusa.com or head on over to hemp-technologies.com. There's a picture of you at the Expo Cannabis down in Uruguay. I snapped that picture and, and went on and spoke right after you there. So that was great. And there you are at uh, an agricultural school there outside Montevideo in mm -hmm. Uruguay. Yeah, what an awesome opportunity it you was. You get to have yeah. legal marijuana there. So that's why you see have actual marijuana plants on the stage, Uruguay being the first country to, to end marijuana prohibition last year on a national basis. Yeah, it was quite amazing to be able to go there and speak through translators and carry the message about industrial hemp farming. And it's one of the things I love about the work that I'm getting to do is really being global and having that opportunity to have my voice and other voices heard through the voice of others, such as having translators. Mm -hmm. You want to tell our audience a little bit about the more about the course that you're teaching at uh, 
Oregon State? Yeah, so Oregon State University, it's uh, course number is WSC 266 in, on industrial hemp. And I just found out to, today actually that they're also now having a marijuana policy course happening yeah. at Oregon State University. So this is really great news, bringing cannabis into academia. Um, you can be anywhere from any age. Uh, thankfully, if you are 65 or older and an Oregon resident, you can take the course for a $25 registration fee. So that really opens this as any extended education. You do get three credits hours for the course and we're now starting into our fifth term and so far we have completed 153 students through the program and one of those students was also Courtney Moran which is really when we we met and connected through the course well that's a great segue over to you Courtney you're a local attorney now aren't you I am yeah I'm a Portland attorney and I actually have a master of laws in environmental and natural resources law with an emphasis in industrial hemp law and I was fortunate enough to be part of the very first course at OSU with Andrea and it's a very fantastic course very comprehensive and you learn a lot from a lot of different experts in their field so I highly recommend anyone take this course if they can you want to tell our audience a little bit more about the work you've been doing here and uh, you, you're based here in Oregon yeah, I'm based right here in Portland, actually, and most recently I have been working with the Department of Agriculture and the Rules Advisory Committee on drafting and developing the industrial hemp rules for the uh, Oregon Industrial Hemp Program. The draft rules uh, public comment period actually ended last Friday, and it is the goal of the Department of Agriculture to finalize rules by February 2nd with the plan of having licenses issued for the 2015 production season. So we are well underway here in Oregon. That's great. So what do you two think about the new rules that the Oregon have been promulgated for industrial hemp? I know Andrea was, was mentioning in Uruguay that she didn't, that she thought there were problematic. There are some major issues with the rules. However, we have both submitted numerous comments and have spoken with the Department of Agriculture and I'm very optimistic that they will take our comments seriously and implement them into the rules so that it will be a successful program. Okay, okay. Uh, as you know, we take viewers' phone calls. I think we've got a couple of callers standing by. Let's go ahead and take one of those calls. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello, Paul. Howdy. It's Michael Magliotti from Phoenix, Arizona. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Very well. What's going on with you? Good. Well, um, right now I'm feeding some hungry dogs some bones that are starving to death, but uh, I wanted to call into the show. I heard you're going to be having some guests to, who are involved with the Hemp Industries Association, and I've been reaching out to them for a couple of months now, trying to get connected, and and this is just a perfect opportunity, opportunity for me to uh, reach out to them and tell them that I'm very interested in getting involved in the movement. Um, I have family that own land in, in Atwater, California, called Mogliotti Farms. They just lease out the land to sweet potato farmers, and so I'm going to my hometown on Monday to meet with a bunch of farmers to educate them about how much money they can make if they started growing industrial hemp. So All I'm right. hoping it passes right. in 2016 there in California so my family can start growing industrial hemp. Do and you know I'm the best way for someone in California to get in touch with HIA? Yeah, so everything you go to thehia.org um, and then also look up our new state chapters. We do not have a state chapter yet in, or, uh, in California. We are looking to build one. There are rules already in Oregon, but right now they need, uh, in, pardon me, in California, but what they need to do now is further develop those so that you can actually apply for your license. So there is forward movement right now to, to basically promulgate those rules so that we've got a, a, a means of actually applying for a license in the state of California. In addition, you're, say, you're stating that you're in Arizona right now. There is massive forward movement also in the state of Arizona. I was just helping review some of the potential regulations in Arizona. So right now it is time to have your voice heard. Go to votehemp.com. You can go up to that take action tab and please take action with the, what we, the forward movement we have right now in, the, in, in Congress. It is important that your voice be heard. And if you're in any state, contact your local police department, contact your local congressional leaders and talk to them about industrial hemp. Engage your community, ask the question, they will appreciate it. And what we're seeing now is just yesterday, you know, speaking with uh, Washington state troopers about, you know, industrial hemp. So we're seeing the engagement, we're seeing the positive energy happening. I've had the DEA already come and inspect one of our site locations for a variety trial. And after 20 years of having, you know, anger and really hatred 
good inside of me for this entity. They were so nice and they wanted to help and they were there really quickly. And it was had to take me to change my brain to say, you know, these people are on our side. They are now trying to help us. They have the rules so that they can actually facilitate to help us. But, and so what an awesome opportunity for the staff of the DEA to have the rules that helps them facilitate the legal cultivation of industrial hemp underneath Section 7606 of the Farm Bill. That's exciting. Yeah, I'm That's actually exciting. meeting with the Improvement Committee of uh, Castle Air Force Base. It's a closed down Air Force Base in my hometown. Me and a couple of guys are working on submitting a federal gov a grant to the federal government that if we make it a federal disaster relief center, they'll fund 80% of the project. So I'm meeting with a big construction company that does building for Intel all over the world, and they're very interested in my project of building the first completely green amusement park called Hemp Valley Amusement Park. I own the domain, and I need to start getting connected with hemp producers to start building the rides out of hemp. I've already got solar panel companies that are on board willing to donate uh, solar panels, and it's going to be like an extreme makeover like they do on TV for homes, but we're going to do extreme makeover and see how quickly we can build the first completely green amusement park. Okay, well, thank you for calling in, and uh, Thanks, good luck Paul, with your project. Your right. And we have another caller who's standing by. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello. Howdy. Hello. First of all, I wanted to say I'm a big fan of your of your show. I love what you guys are doing, Thank spreading you. the uh, the knowledge about hemp and and cannabis and getting it out there. And so I'm a big fan. Thank you. <laughs> Second of all, um, with all of the legalization that's been happening do, do you have any projections or predictions for 2016 do you think it's going to explode and and become more uh more of an industry more hands oh certainly i mean it's already cannabis. qualified for a vote in nevada in 2016 there are a lot of various groups that are vying to uh set up an initiative in the state of california there are two different initiatives in Ohio, two different initiatives in Maine, an initiative in the southern state, Mississippi. There's a lot of forward momentum for ending cannabis prohibition in 2016. Oh, that, that's just amazing. And with the hemp, uh, you know, being able to grow hemp in Oregon, I mean, I'm an Oregonian, and I'm proud to say that, that you know, we're going to have hemp growing in Oregon, so... That's just great. Thank you for taking my call. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for calling. Thanks. Okay. So. So if we're going to grow industrial hemp in Oregon, what needs to happen? Right? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I would always advise is to start with some really basic variety trials so that we can mm -hmm. start uh, isolating the varieties that are going to grow well in Oregonian conditions. As we know, the state is really diverse in its landscape right. and its agricultural systems. the system. Willamette Valley where, you know, there's a lot of moisture. Mm -hmm. The southern Oregon climates, the eastern Oregon climates. And we I know Paul wants to grow for seed, so he wants to find plants that will produce an enormous amount of seed to help produce oils so that we can... Uh, maybe uh, make the industrial make the fuel fuel and a plastic a reality and a uh, product for those new 3d printers out there and we always have our little hemp flame of freedom here which is a little bit of hemp seed oil with a little piece of this hemp twine make that demonstrates the energy potential of cannabis and I think ultimately we're going to have to get the lawyers involved in order to get our POW sent back home. You know, at the end of uh, any war, we've had our POW sent back to us, even in the Vietnam War. They, we, they sent back their bones and their bodies. But in the war on drugs, our POWs just sit behind our American prisons. We've got to get that changed. It's very true. We do need to get that changed. And along the lines of industrial hemp, actually, uh, there has been some progress on the federal level last Thursday um, a, bar, a bipartisan amend or in bill was introduced into the Senate Senate bill 134 with co-sponsors uh, from both senators from Oregon Ron Wyden and Jeff Merkley and both senators from Kentucky Rand Paul and the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell introduced it um, it's the Industrial Hemp Farming Act of 2015 and I heard rumors today that uh, next Tuesday Representative Jared Polis from Colorado and Representative Thomas Massey from Kentucky will be introducing the companion bill in the House of Representatives. 
So I think that 2015 is going to be a big year on the federal level. And what... <laughs> little applause here in the studio audience. Absolutely. And what this is going to do is it would remove industrial hemp from the Controlled Substances Act definition of marijuana and specifically any cannabis sativa that has 0.3% THC or less will be removed from the definition of marijuana and will no longer be a Schedule One controlled substance or any controlled substance for that matter, which will open up the door for any state that does have uh, legislation in place so that they can actually implement full cultivation in their states. What do you think the likelihood of that making it through one or both houses of Congress? I think there's a very good chance. This is the first time that there has been bipartisan support for both bills in, bo in both the House and the Senate. I mean, 19 plus states have now legalized some form of cultivation, so the people are really speaking out. I mean, this is not a drug. This is a, an agricultural crop. Our economy needs this. Our farmers need this, and it just only makes sense to push this through. And it would seem like in the last year, the DEA has slowly but surely announced uh, w one step at a time their surrender. I mean, first Eric Holder said they're going to stop uh, profiling. Then Eric Holder said they're going to stop arrest, uh, kicking in doors and doing drug raids and states with this medical marijuana. Then Eric Holder said they're going to stop arresting people that are just involved with the marijuana only in those states. Then he said he wants to start releasing people who are involved in uh, crimes that no violence was uh, concurred into. And I can only assume that, uh, you know, Paul, Eric and I have been hanging out this past year and a half over the holidays, you know. Okay. And he's been smoking your pot. And I can only I guess you've been smoking it, too. Well, yeah, and I can only assume that smoking your herb has made Eric Holder see the light. Okay, um, maybe you smoked a little <laughs> too much, Casper. I don't know. We have a studio audience. Oh, there. There's, see? There you are. There I'm, we are on a, on a weekend vacation. Uh, he looks like he's got a, a priest collar. Yeah. We've got uh, a studio audience member. If you're interested in coming down to our studio audience, we uh, have an open house here every Friday night at our studio. So uh, get in touch with us. But go ahead, studio audience member. I just want to amplify a very important part of this discussion. I think it's getting minimalized there are people who are in prison right now yeah why why is that so far down the list i want to see those people released you know they don't you know what we got people in prison right now who did nothing except use god's plan why Maybe. isn't that the first priority okay that's a good question we should be asking our congressman um, you know, uh, we have another telephone caller standing by. Let's take a telephone call. Welcome to the show, caller. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. You may have already addressed this, uh, but I don't uh, watch all the time. Uh, it's about medicinal cannabis. Uh, I went through a process that took a few months, and both my physician, amazingly, and my therapist decided that uh, medicinal cannabis would be good for me to give it a try. Great. Um, I went through the process. Um, eight weeks ago, I sent off for my card uh, with the amount, and then probably because of the holidays, it took a good seven weeks, unlike the four weeks they say it, it, it would take at most. But I was then told, um, I got a letter saying that I would need an additional $180 and have to go through the whole process again, and it would be weeks and weeks. Um, I'm... Uh, I, I am retired, I'm a senior, um, I'm on Medicare, and my funds are limited. Uh, but I was told, and I thought because I had disability, that I would be eligible for a discount, and instead, it's still $200 to get my card. That's um, outrageous. You know, Oregon has the highest f annual fee for yeah. medical marijuana permit holders than any other state in the country. In Hawaii, it's uh, $35. And, uh, it's $25 in Montana and $5 a year to renew it. Hmm. Yeah. So hey, Oregon's fee that? was raised by the legislature a few years ago to raise money. I think raising money off the backs of sick and dying patients is disturbing and wrong. But uh, well, you can just reach out to our legislators and urge them to change that fee <coughs> structure. They're the ones who raised it, and they're the, one, the only ones who can, they did it you know, via a law. And they're really the only ones who can lower it. But 
I would recommend that you contact your state representative and let them know the problems this has caused for you. Yeah, it, it really has been very disheartening because uh, another $180 on top of everything else, and I'm on disability, uh, they told yeah, me that I could... You don't get much money to live on. ...for food stamps, you know, and that's a process that takes quite a bit that's rather daunting, and maybe I would get $8 worth, and then I could get a discount, but not before I've already been processed at a higher rate, $200. I just think that's outrageous. I do, too. I'm sorry that uh, they're putting you through that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I just wondered if you were putting any pressure... Uh, uh, yeah, we are, you know, and, and the best thing to do is for mm -hmm. you and all the people watching and listening to this to contact your state legislators and urge them to change that fee structure. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm sure it had been addressed. It's just it's pretty raw for me at the moment, and I'm kind of dealing with the aftermath. So right. thank you very much. Well, thanks for calling, bringing that to our viewers' attention. It is an incredibly high fee and very difficult mm -hmm. for people who are sick to, to pay that. But uh, uh, speaking of fees, the uh, amount of money that has been brought in by the states here this past year with the recreational marijuana and the medical marijuana and then the money that's been saved from not arresting and prosecuting has made other states envious, hasn't it? Well, yeah, you know, they're bringing in the recreational dollars in both Colorado and Washington. We haven't done that in Oregon. The fees that are raised here uh, by Oregon's medical marijuana program and the Department of Health or Oregon Health Authority are used for other health programs, but uh, I don't think they should be doing that to help, you know, for on the backs of patients mm -hmm. to access their medicine. I, I think that's, that's wrong. I thought it was wrong when they raised the fee. The fee should be a lot, lot lower and uh, uh, we're working to do, make that so, but the best way to do it is for all of us to reach out to our legislators and know how wrong this policy is. Well, thankfully in Canada, underneath our hemp regulations, the license to cultivate industrial hemp is free. Um, you just have to put in the application, and we will know here in Oregon there will be a minimal fee. Um, and as you know, hopefully what we'll see is once the startup of the program comes on and we start seeing some revenue and we start figuring the way that those fees will be reduced. But there may be a need for some states to implement a fee structure in the initial beginning for the cultivation of hemp here. So mm -hmm. just be prepared for that and be willing to understand that we are going into something new. We need regulations. People need to be hired perhaps, and the infrastructure needs to be put in place. So just hopefully know that the regulations, uh, you know, the fees, we'll see those decrease over time, we'll hope at least. Yeah. So you mentioned Canada, and I know you've been working in Canada. You were a resident up there. And you go and test the hemp field, don't you, during harvest? Do you want to explain how you do that? Yeah, well, I actually had the honor of becoming a Canadian citizen, so now holding my dual citizenship. Right. But one of the roles, I am a professional agrologist, and underneath my professional agrologist standing provides me the opportunity to apply to be an authorized hemp sampler, to do the field samplers for Health Canada. They are independent, so we all are independent samplers, and we send those to independent laboratories. So essentially what I do there is around when 50% of the seeds are resistant to compression so the seeds that are set on the seed have a little bit of a snap to them mm -hmm. but it's still a little bit of a give when you're about right there 50 50 that's when the perfect time to go in and pull the sample out in that i am taking 60 random samples from the field taking about the top one third of the flowering parts the seed head on the top and then take those back, dry those down, screen them out, and then send them to the lab. And as per our regulations and the same regulations that are being set here in the U.S., is 0.3% or less THC in the flowering parts of the plant, in the green parts of the plant, and then thus it is uh, released and released in a very soft sense so we don't see field tests over 0.3 percent typically and then it's released and then the grain can be then further sold to the food processing facility for processing. Have you ever had any that was rejected because the THC uh, level was was higher? No we've had none rejected we have had some retested but none rejected. That's good to know. Yes good it know. is good to know and that's one of the things we'll need to do also here in Oregon and of course I've offered services to help train staff so people don't need to fear about how easy it really is. I'll come down and help that happen anywhere in the United States to set and help the Ag Department put those rules into place and add comfort to the staff when they're, they're experimenting and you know learning about how to test a new crop and sample a new crop. Okay we have another caller let's uh, take another phone call here. Welcome to the show caller. 
Hello. Howdy. How? Howdy. How you doing, Paul? Howdy. Pretty well. How are you? I am wonderful. Good. Say, I got a question for you about uh, CBD oils. Uh, there, there is a company out of, I, I believe it's Europe somewhere, that is uh, is experimenting and uh, the, the, they are looking to get a patent on CBD for, I believe it's brain cancer. The company's name is GW Pharmaceuticals. How is that going to affect other companies that are producing CBD oils? You know, I am not certain, to be honest. You know, GW has been able to market three cannabis medicinal products for sublingual delivery. They spray it in your mouth. Little bits absorbed under the, uh, the tongue, but most of it goes down the throat and absorbed in your digestive tract. But uh, w the three products, one of them's high in CBD, the other one's high in THC, and the, the third product is uh, equal in, in both. And so uh, the United States government has a patent on CBD and THC for anti-cancer properties and medicinal properties. So there's already a, a health and human services patent held by the federal government. So I don't know how those things play out. You're the attorney, Courtney. What do you think? I'll pass to you. Uh, well, I am not a patent attorney, but I mean, it will depend if they're granted that patent, what the patent specifically is for, if it's for one product or you know exactly what it's for. So it's just going to depend specifically for that application. And that particular company has been very gregarious in their research and in their uh, patents. And uh, they are really earnestly putting forth a true effort to corner that market, not just in the Canadian and the British Isles, but also around the world. So there are some people who call them the monsters, the beasts that we have to watch out for that will swoop in and take over the industry. And they started working on it back in 1998. I yep. remember meeting the founder of GW Pharmaceuticals, Jeffrey Guy, at a conference at Regents College in London back in 1998 when he was just starting the company. So they've been at it a long time. They've been backed by Bayer, the aspirin company and pharmaceutical company. And uh, I don't know what their market cap is, but they've had hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars invested in that company to date. So do you suspect that uh, they would patent a certain uh, combination of CBD versus uh, CBD and THC? And uh, I, I know of other companies that are, are working on strains, you know, with yeah. different CBDs versus THCs. Well, for I different think they are illness. trying to obtain pharmaceutical distribution through, you know, drugstores and pharmacies. And so I really can't speak to it with any degree of authority. Uh, uh, we'll just have to see how that plays out. But thanks for your call. Absolutely. Thank you for the call. You're very welcome. Do you mind if I uh, give a shout out to Omaha Normal? Go right ahead. All right. Please support Omaha Normal. Thank you very much. All right. We recommend uh, supporting those efforts there. Omaha. It's normal to get high. Okay. You know, we have uh, a little show and tell session here. I'm going to run through it really quick. We'll bring camera two in. We want to thank uh, Hemp Man, Eric Loitz, for bringing in a few things. One of them is this nifty old French postcard. You can see a French hemp harvest. Right behind it we have harvesting hemp in China. This is in Sichuan province. Uh, not sure of the exact date on this. Look at those but, stocks. Uh, those stocks yeah, look strong and sturdy. They do. They do. That's a lot of manual labor right there. Then, you know, we uh, used to have a guy who lived here in Portland who's been on this show many times and was a mentor for Casper and I. He first published this book, a kind of cartoon book on how to grade various varieties of cannabis. It's Jack Hare's first book, 
And then he wrote the first edition of this book called The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And this is actually the very first newsprint edition of this magazine that came out in uh, 1985. It's got an autograph circa 1989 from Jack here. And then here is the first edition. It was uh, bound of the book, uh, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. I've uh, got one of those. You notice it says uh, uh, the California Marijuana Initiative and the Oregon Marijuana Initiative on it. This was uh, first printed back in 1985, and I helped Jack put that together. He actually put together the first uh, version of this book, which is, I think, now in its, its seventh or 15th edition, 15th uh, revision. Uh, he passed away about six years ago. But he put this together in my house back in 1985, and we worked together on that. Right here are some hemp paper pads. I imported hemp paper starting back in uh, 1990, and this is a product that we sold out there, Tree Free Eco Paper. We'll close in on that a little bit more. And so we're moving forward in time. Now we're up to the early 90s, earlier this year widen that screen out. I saw that Andrea here was uh, advocating selling some of these for the Hemp Industry Association, wasn't that? Oh no, this is for iHemp Radio, which I is hemp radio, my radio thing. show here that I have on the Time for Hemp Network. So this is a hemp, do you want to describe what this is? Yeah, so this is a hemp composite briefcase. It is a hemp and canaf mat that is then infused with um, bio resins to make a hard shell case. Not what are those only, resins? Are they any of them they, hemp? They are a bioplastic and okay. then the fibers that you see on the inside are a blend of canaf and hemp fibers together. So this just shows how as natural fibers we also work really well with our other natural fibers in the industry. And in addition to the case, uh, um, you picked up the little hemp kit also. The hemp kit. So you want to tell our audience what these things yeah, are here. So right here we have a um, a ball of hemp crete. So what I do with the hemp kits is that you can get the additional, um, the, with the briefcase you can get the additional hemp kit also as a little education piece. So one of those is a hemp crete ball. So what you have here is the inner core portion of the stock which is similar to some of what's, what we have here in this bag, the little woody portions that you see in here. And then we mix this with a, a lime binder and water, and this becomes a non-structural component of the wall insulation. Or you can compress them into blocks to have construct, uh, structural components of the wall. It's breathable, uh, resistant to mold, resistant to fire, and you can learn more about that at hemp-technologies.com. And so that's carbon negative. And this is a carbon negative is what the tests have shown for our colleagues in the UK. Now this is one of the reasons why we want to be cultivating industrial hemp in this country is it so that we can start decorticating those stalks to create that herd that will need to go into this building application. And not only can you use this herd in um, a hemp creep, but you can also use it in a hemp block, which I think you may have a hemp block in there too, perhaps. I heard that. And what oh, we, there oh, it yeah, is. Yeah, here we there go. So here's a little bitty piece of a pressed board. And this also is using the hemp herd and then press. This is made in Canada. Nice, just a little bitty press block there. Keep all this organized. I'll try to put it back and in the container. And then right here we have uh, hemp insulation. So this is a pink insulation replacement. And you can get this in various sizes. And of course, it's cut to be uh, 15 or 16 inches, depending on what you need. It can come with or without a fire retardant, depending on your needs and building codes. And does that make you itch, like when you're using fiberglass? This would not make you itch as much as what we'll say with fiberglass. But always when you're working with natural fibers, it is important to wear a mask and wear protective clothing because these little fine fibers can also, you can breathe those in. So over time, it would have an impact on you. But if you were to sit your or your child right here you can see I'm touching it I'm not going to get itchy from it so from that short uh, touching you're not going to have the same things from a pink insulation but I would advise professionally to um, so here's to one that's a little bit thinner yeah so here we have I think these are both made in um, like a needle punch machine uh, as a non-woven matting this is a very thin piece so you could use this as what is essentially made into this uh, briefcase right here is this type of matting that is then molded and infused. You could also use this as something to go underneath uh, uh, countertops uh, or as um, perhaps uh, soil retention. Nifty.
And last but not least. Yes, and last but not least, what we have here is the bast fiber on the inside. Uh, so this is the outside of the stock, and these are the long bass fibers that we, you would use to make those non-woven mattings and to make the uh, hemp insulation. So I said last, but there's one more item here. You have hemp bast fiber. Yep, hemp Here's bast the fiber. Hemp fiber. You want to tell our audience the difference between yeah. the two? Yeah, so this is the little woody core on the inside. This is the hemp herd. You can see this in all cannabis plants. They all have the long bass fiber on the outside. And that bass fiber on the outside is what our colleagues like in China are using to make the amazing textiles, such as what I have on right now. This is hemp orium from South Africa. Um, and then the inner core here is the woody portion. But you could also use this in type of application such as gasification to create heat in greenhouses and in homes. So this is a very or animal room, bedding. Or animal bedding. Amazing for animal bedding. We just cleaned out our chicken coop and we had the top part with straw and underneath we had the hemp herd. And so surprising in Canada at our minus 30 weather how the hemp herd was still really light and fluffy and it was able to remove the straw quite quickly. Well thank you. Uh, the, got to share the, the sharing yes, section here. You. That's great. Hemp show and tell. Yes, I like that. I try to do some sort of show and tell during the majority of shows. And then, of course, we have our hemp twine here and our hemp seed oil. Looks like it's burned through the wick there. Well, every member of Congress and every member of the Senate should have a little attache case like that sent to them. Well, I do know that uh, Massey picked one of those cases up, so you'll see him floating around up on the hill, and also Ben Droz, which is our lobbyist up in Capitol Hill for Vote Him. Once again, go to votehemp.com and take action today to reach out to your congressional leaders. We are closing down with about six minutes left. So in addition to the Hempcrete uh, exposition or, or class you're having tomorrow, what else are you doing in Oregon? Well, we had a, a screening of Bringing It Home, the movie, uh -huh. which is an international award-winning movie about hemp construction, focusing on what's happening right now in the UK and in the United States. In addition, uh, helping with the legislation, we had an opportunity to, made, to meet with the Extension Services at Oregon State University, so really to helping to develop that. Um, also, we have interest from on campus to move forward with a short course on hempcrete, so I'm really knowing that Oregon State University is going to step forward and be a gap and bring together the industry and the farmers and really play a key role in development of the hemp industry here in Oregon. Well, I really want to thank you, Andrea, for being such a dynamo in getting this going and doing so much on an international basis. It was a real honor to, to be down speaking back to back with you down in Montevideo, Uruguay at uh, Uruguay's first cannabis conference that was exciting here just last month yeah, almost yeah. to the day they sold a board of six thousand tickets for five dollars a piece had a really diverse crew in there it was really great to see it definitely was it definitely was it was good felt really safe to be in a country where marijuana is just legal we were able to get up from the table at the restaurant and step aside and share a joint and as i was leaving at the uh the lounge there, I took out my volcano and vaporized. While other people were, were having alcoholic drinks, I was able to, to use my vaporizer Felt very at the airport. familiar there, I thought. Yeah, I really, I really like that. I look forward to going back. I know there's a lot of developments there. So, Courtney, you want to give a plug for, for what you're doing right now and ways that uh, people can find out about your professional activities? Uh, sure, you can always give me a call at 541-632-HEMP. That's 541-632-4367. I will be staying in contact with the Department of Agriculture to make sure the rules come out on time so that we can have licenses issued for this upcoming production season. If you are interested in cultivating, feel free to contact me or the Department of Agriculture so that you can keep apprised of what's going on and when it's time for you to actually apply for a license so that you too can be cultivating this summer. And Andrea, would you like to tell our viewers one more time how they can get in touch with you and Absol your activities? Absolutely. You can check me out at hemp-technologies.com. My email is andrea, A-N-N, -N, at hemptech usa.com in addition uh, with hemp ace we're putting on the hempcrete workshop tomorrow so gear up for more of those we've got five more coming up definitely across the u.s we're looking at kentucky and and somewhere in the east and in texas so a lot of energy building there of when and course. where is that class um well our class tomorrow is in portland we are sold out so wow. it's so great so sorry but we'll yeah, be back thankfully for that um, in addition you can go to the hia.org and also please go to votehemp.com go up to that take action tab 
grab and take action. It's so important right now, especially since the House Bill 525 is about to be reintroduced, the Industrial Hemp Farming Act of 2015. It's right now is a great time to have your voice heard. So get out and reach out to your congressional leaders. Yeah, yes. I just want to echo that. Yeah, if you are in Oregon, um, you know, feel free to contact the Department of Agriculture. If you're in any other state, contact your local legislatures and tell them that you want to see hemp legalized in your state if it already isn't. And if it is, contact your federal congressmen and women and let them know that you do want them to co-sponsor either Senate Bill 134 or House Bill 525. Jasper, time for hemp.com. Tune in, share it with your friends. We'll talk more about it next week. We've only got 45 seconds left to hear from John. I also want to just mention that we lost uh, one of our guests here recently. Uh, Benton McKenzie in Iowa passed away. We had some video ready to roll, but we'll be running that on future shows. Next week we have NFL uh, defensive back uh, Khalif Mitchell be talking about cannabis for uh, uh, sports uh, activities and so we'll have him on next week thanks for watching we got John Cornette that's going to play a few moments of tunes help us restore him Thank you.